So we've started with some results about rational numbers and irrational numbers. We haven't done much yet, but we have at least shown that there's at least one irrational number. We know that the square root of 2 is irrational. <laughs> That's what we did last time. That's uh, a great feat. Also, we did it by uh, indirect... Uh, Indirect proof, proof by contradiction. So we had a bit of practice at that at the same time. Uh, that's that one the first happen. Where's my undo button? Okay. Yeah, so that's all we've got so far. But I did say last time that there are rather a lot of rational numbers and irrational numbers, and that wherever you look on the real line, and whatever interval you look in, you're going to find lots of rational and irrational numbers. And that's what we're going to build up to today we're going to be showing that the rational numbers and the irrational numbers are what they call dense in the real line, meaning that any interval you look in, no matter how small an interval you look in, you're always going to find at least one rational number inside that interval and at least one irrational number somewhere inside that interval, no matter how small that interval is, as long as it's sort of not a degenerate interval that's come down to one point or something like that. Right, so... Along the way, we're going to build up a few more standard results that you will be able to quote most of the time, unless, of course, you're asked to prove one of these results, in which case, as I always said, you're never allowed to quote a result to prove itself. You could quote a standard result to prove the next result, and it may be quite easy to prove the next result from the result before. But uh, if you're asked to prove part of what I call the algebra of rationals, you're not allowed to quote the algebra of rationals to prove that part of the algebra of rationals. On the other hand, when I ask you more complicated questions, and you'll get more complicated questions, I don't want you proving the algebra of rationals all over again when you could have just quoted the algebra of rationals. I'll say more about that when we get there. All right. Okay, so what's all this business about the algebra of rationals? Uh, well, okay, let's start by thinking about integers, whole numbers. Integers come with some nice operations um, of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Okay? And if you take two integers, m and n, if you add them, that's an integer. If you subtract one from the other, that's still an integer. And if you multiply two integers, it's still an integer. Um, if you're working with positive integers, then you couldn't necessarily subtract, because you can't subtract... Uh, if you're working with positive integers, and you subtract um, one from another, you may end up with something that's zero or negative, which wouldn't be a positive integer anymore. So... If you start with the positive integers and you start doing subtraction, then you're going to have to introduce the rest of the integers to deal with that um, to get something slightly bigger. Um, but even if you're working with all the integers, you get trouble with division. First of all, you're not allowed to divide by zero. But even if you're not dividing by zero, you might leave the integers. Um, because 2 over 3, for example, is not an integer. So although the integers have got some nice properties, you can add them, subtract them, multiply them, when it comes to division, you get two problems. One, you can't divide by zero, and two, even if you don't divide by zero, you may still leave the integers and move into something bigger, like the rational numbers. Now, if you look at the real numbers, it's slightly better, because you can add real numbers, subtract real numbers, and you're still real numbers. You can multiply real numbers, and you're still a real number. You still can't divide by zero, that's not allowed, but you can divide a real number by a non-zero real number and still get a real number. And that's an improvement, okay? Um, this makes the real numbers, some, in fact, into something called a field. A field is a bit better than some of the other things you meet because as long as you're not divided by zero, you can divide and you stay in the field. And the real numbers is a nice field, okay? And um, mathematical structures, you'll see more about this, and there'll be a lot more about it next year in the Algebra and Number Theory module. And, oh, the complex numbers are a field as well. You've already done some stuff with the complex numbers. Um, you can add complex numbers. You can subtract complex numbers. You can multiply complex numbers. And you can divide by non-zero complex numbers. And you stay in the complex numbers. So the complex numbers are a field as well. Okay, so complex numbers are good. The real numbers are good. Um, we're gonna, the first thing we're going to do today is show that the rational numbers are a field as well. In other words, um, we'll, check it, we'll, check, we'll 
rather briefly point out how obvious this is, but bear in mind that it is an improvement on the integers. You can divide a rational number by a non-zero rational number and you'll still be a rational number. So this is what's called the algebra of rational numbers. This is the standard result. Of course, most, uh, most of the results in the notes are standard results. Okay. That means that if you're asked to prove something more complicated, you can quote this and you probably don't have to prove it. But if you're asked to prove this or a bit of this, you can't quote it to prove itself. So if someone says, show that if x and y are rational numbers and y is not zero, so suppose someone asks you for this bit. They say, let x and y be rational numbers and suppose that y is not zero, show that x over y is a rational number. You can't say, by the, by the algebra of rationals, x over y is a rational number because you're, you're being asked to prove a bit of the algebra of rationals. Whereas, if you're asked to prove something more complicated later, um, then you're allowed to quote the algebra of rationals and say, since x and y are rational numbers and y is not zero, then x over y is a rational number as well. Okay, so we really only need to sketch the proof of this, but nevertheless, we, need to, we should use the definition, okay? So we'll do, we'll do that bit properly. So I'll call it a sketch. Okay, because I'm not going to do it in, completely in full. Um, but we'll do some of it properly. For a start, since x and y are in Q, there are... Now, they, both of them will have an M and an N, so that they are M over N, but they're different, right? So I need to use notation so that I know that they're going to have to be made up of different integers. So there are M1. There'll be an integer M1 and a natural number, and you can use lots of different ones. Um, there's a natural number n1, so that x is equal to m1 over n1. And there are m2 in z, n2, a natural number, with y equals m2 over M2. Now, we'll just find some expressions for some of these and see how easy it is to see that they're still rational numbers. So we're going to look at x, y, x plus y, x minus y, and we'll, have to see, we'll see what does it mean to say y is non-zero so that we can do x over y, and why might there be an issue? Okay, so let's have a look. Um, so we start with x, y, and that's a particularly easy one. xy is equal to m1, m2 divided by n1, n2. And you will notice that m1, m2 is an integer and n1, n2 is a positive integer. So this is a rational number. Notice no danger of dividing by zero n1's not zero, n2's not zero. In fact, n1 and n2 are actually positive integers, so n1 and n2 is a positive integer as well. Also, x plus y is equal to m1 over n1. This is primary school stuff. Well, maybe secondary school, we'll see. Uh, m2 over n2. Better put them over a common denominator. That's equal to m1 n2 plus n1 m2 over n1 n2. And the numerator is an integer. And the denominator is a positive integer. So this is in Q as well. Let me put as that little bit of extra information, note that n1, n2 is actually a natural number. There you are, just not just any old integer and certainly not zero. Okay. 
And x minus y is similar. But the interesting one is the division. Okay? So, if y is not zero, well, n2 is also not zero, um, because we know we're not dividing by zero. So, the only way for y to be zero is if m2 is zero. And if y is not zero, then m2 is not zero. Okay? So, this is the last bit. If y is not equal to zero, then m2 is not equal to zero. And we have x over y, that's equal to m1 over n1 divided by m2 over n2. We're not dividing by zero. Um, we know n1 is not 0, n2 is not 0. We can multiply things around. There's no problem at all. This is equal to m1 n2 over m2 n1. Now, this is not in standard form because uh, you see, usually for rational numbers, we would have an integer on the top and a positive integer on the bottom, but we don't know that that's a positive integer on the bottom. However, I did mention <coughs> at some point that if you divided an integer by a non-zero integer, you still got a rational number. However, just in case that bothers you, I will note that that's also equal to minus m1n2 over minus m2n1. Okay? Now, at least one of, M, one of M2N1 or minus M2N1 is going to be positive. Okay? So, at least one of these two is a rational number in sort of its usual form. Not lowest terms, but at least we can arrange it so that we get a positive integer on the bottom. So it definitely is a rational number, even if M2N1 is negative, because you can just rewrite it as minus M1N2 over minus M2N1 in that case, and then you'll have got a positive thing on the bottom and a different integer at the top. So that's definitely in Q. <coughs> and so my comment is <coughs> one of M two N one and minus M two N one is positive. So I'll say, I'll stop there, but you're welcome to fill in extra details there, but uh, that's all I'm going to say about it, right? So that should fit with what you expected from primary school, secondary school, about adding, subtracting, dividing rational numbers and getting rational numbers. But let me just check. Are there any questions about that result about rational numbers? Yes? So you could say that's how you define the operations on the rational numbers is the question, and that's correct, but it may be that you didn't check it very carefully at school to make sure that what you get at the end was still a rational number. So what we've done really is check something that you were just told at school, and maybe you checked it properly at school and maybe you didn't. But these are the operations that you will have done at school um, on rational numbers, and you knew how to add and subtract fractions already. So all we've done is put it into university language, what you pretty much already knew. Okay? So we haven't done much work. But I hope I've reassured you that you can, do, you can manipulate rational numbers the way you expected. Any, any other questions about what you can do with rational numbers? Okay. If you're not sure why I did this trick with the M2N1 and minus M2N1, um, you can think about it for yourself, and if you're still not sure why I did it, you can, uh, you can always ask me. So, here's your first chance to vote, but I want to make sure I explain the question, 
Uh, I have zeroed the answers, so you can vote whenever you like, but I'm going to just explain this question um, because it, this is the first question which causes some confusion, I think, as to what the question means. So the question says, how many of these statements are true for all real numbers x and y? But the statements have got ifs in. Okay? So statements are things like, if x and y are both irrational, then x plus y is irrational. So this one counts as true for all x and y if... Whenever, whenever, you, whenever you look at x and y that are both irrational, you always get irrational number by adding them. And it's false if you can find a couple of irrational numbers which, when you add them together, give you a rational number. So you only have to find one counterexample, and this one gets a not always true. Whereas if there's no counterexamples, like if you can prove it, then it, gets an, it is always true. Um, and uh, so four different statements here. Is it true that whenever x and y are both irrational, you always have x plus y irrational? Is it always true that if x and y are both irrational, then x times y is irrational? What happens if you add a rational number to an irrational number? Is it always true that if you add a rational number to an irrational number, then you get an irrational number? And what about multiplying a rational number by an irrational number? Do you always get an irrational number? Okay, so I'll let you think about those. You have to count, uh, work them all out and count up how many you think are true. That is always true. Try and find counter, try and find counter examples for the ones that you think are not true. And I'll let you think about that for a couple of minutes and then we'll see what you found up. Maybe I'll give you a, a, a reasonable number of minutes for that one. Okay, as I was saying, uh, only one of these is correct. One of them is almost correct, but that's not good enough. And uh, two of them are easily seen to be false. So we need to find some counterexamples. Okay? So the one that's true is that if x is rational and y is irrational, then x plus y is irrational. Um, the sum of irrational numbers is sometimes rational. The product of irrational numbers is sometimes rational. <laughs> And the product of a rational number and an irrational number is just very occasionally rational. <laughs> so let's try and find the counterexamples. Okay, so first of all, who wants to tell me two irrational numbers, two irrational numbers that add to a rational number? Yeah? That's my favourite, okay. Root 2 plus minus root 2 equals naught. Uh, actually, we haven't proved that minus root 2 is irrational, except that the same proof we had last time actually works. Um, in a moment, we'll... we'll mm, it is... I think we only proved that root 2 was, was irrational last time, and it's pretty obvious that minus root 2 is as well. Um, I, accept, uh, I accept that at this point, but in a result a tiny bit further down, we're going to see all sorts of things involving root 2 are irrational anyway. So, yes, that's a good example. Um, and I'm sure lots of other people did similar things with pi and e and things. I prefer people to use root 2 at the moment because we haven't proved that pi and e are irrational, even though it's, a, it's well known from the books. We won't prove in this module that pi is irrational. Um, I might set as an exercise to prove that e is irrational at some point, but we won't prove it in the lectures. Um, so root 2 and various things like that we will deal with. But there's lots of other kinds of irrational numbers around. OK, so let's get someone else to tell me um, a couple of irrational numbers whose product is irrational. Who wants, yeah? Root 2 and root 2. So root 2 times root 2 equals 2. OK, so root 2 is irrational. Root 2 is irrational, but multiply them together and you get 2, which is rational. OK. Uh, we'll prove 3 properly in a bit, and I'll say something more about 4, but first we need a counterexample to 4. So, um, oh yeah, up, up there? Root 2 and 0, exactly. Well, that is, we'll take x to be 0 and y to be root 2. Okay, uh, so the only way, in fact, to multiply a rational number by an irrational number and get a rational number is if you're multiplying by zero. But uh, unfortunately that's available and so that makes this statement 
not always true. <laughs> okay? But uh, you can, nevertheless, show that if x, at least if x is not zero, and x is rational, and y is irrational, then you can prove that xy is irrational. But that, uh, that's something else. So we'll do that. Well, let's do some proof. We've got the counterexamples now. Now let's see some proofs. So how do we prove that if x is rational and y is irrational, then x plus y is irrational? So proof of three. Given that x is rational and y is irrational, um, our target is to show, or we show, and this is our target, that x plus y is irrational. That's our target. We haven't proved it yet. Okay? It's always dangerous to write down what you want to prove early on in case you forget that you haven't proved it yet and start using it, which would not be a good thing because then it would be a circular argument. So we don't know this yet. So... <coughs> Set z equal x plus y. You don't have to do this, but I'm just going to do it to tidy things up a bit. We've got to show that this is irrational. I'm going to do it by an indirect proof. Suppose for contradiction, Z is rational. And we're going to get a contradiction from this, from which we'll conclude that that's impossible. This is our only dodgy assumption. Okay? We've been given information. We're making one assumption here that we're going to hope to be incorrect because we want this to be false. And that's how indirect proofs work. Um, okay, now we've got Z is X plus Y, we've assumed Z is rational, X is rational, and Y is irrational. How can we get a contradiction from, to this using the algebra of rationals? Any suggestions? Yes? Uh, y equals Z minus X? Yeah, Y is equal to Z minus X. That's in Q, by the algebra of rationals, since X and Z are both in Q, we're given, right? Just check that we're not lying. Um, X was rational, Z we're assuming is rational. Okay, but this contradicts the fact that y is irrational, which we've got up here. Now, we only made one dodgy assumption. That's this one. So let me describe that as our dodgy assumption. <laughs> right? No. Uh, that's, uh, what I really mean is we've assumed something that we hope is going to be false. And since we've arrived at contradiction, this contradiction proves that Z is not in Q. So Z is irrational.
It's certainly a real number, so it's not in Q, so it's an irrational number. Okay, and uh, that's the truth of that one. Any questions about that as to why we're doing it in such a long, complicated, messy way when you can see an obvious way to prove it? I think this one probably does need something like an indirect proof. You might be able to get it as a contrapositive of some other true statement. Um, if you do the algebra of rationals, if you express the algebra of rationals in a certain way, you can get this as a contrapositive of one rephrasing of the algebra of rationals. But you have to rephrase it the right way to get the contrapositive. Um, so we've done it as a proof by contradiction instead. Any questions about that proof? So what I'm going to do is leave as an exercise the correct version of 4 show that 4 becomes true that was the one about multiplying things if you assume in addition that x is not 0. Uh, so what was that? Let's, uh, I'll just go back to the... So that's, uh, I'm saying here that uh, if you said that x is a non-zero rational number and y is irrational, then x, y is irrational, that then becomes true. But you have to assume that x is not 0, because as we saw, if x is 0, then you've had it. Um, 0 times anything is 0. So I'll leave that one as an exercise for you. So here's a corollary which will prove in a rather similar way. And the nice thing about this is it gives us a very big supply of irrational numbers. Okay? There's a lot of these. However, we must take y to be not zero here. So it says here, if x and y are rational numbers, with y not being zero, then x plus y times root 2 is irrational. So that's going to give us lots of irrational numbers. But we had to insist that y is not zero, because otherwise you're talking x plus naught, which is x. And x is rational. So you very much need y to be not zero here, or you've had it. Okay? But as soon as y is not 0, you can take, so you can take any rational number x. You don't care whether it's 0 or not. You can add it to any rational multiple of root 2 as long as you're not multiplying the root 2 by 0. Um, of course, this all goes completely wrong if x and y stop. Uh, if you sort of allow y to be irrational, then you're in trouble because y could be root 2 and then this would become rational again. So this is the result about combining a rational number with a rational multiple of root 2 and moreover it's a non-zero rational multiple of root 2. Okay, this proof is very similar to what we just did so it won't take very long. Um, so given such x and y So I'm assuming that x is rational, and y is rational, and that y is not zero. Okay? And again, I'll set z equal x plus y root 2. Suppose for contradiction that z is rational. So suppose for contradiction... ..that z is in Q. Then y root 2, you can do this in one, actually you can do this in all in one step if you like, but I'm going to do it in two. y root 2 is equal to z minus x is in Q by the algebra of rationals. Just check that. Z we've assumed is rational. X 
is assumed to be a rational number in the statement. Okay? So we're using the information we've got. Uh, so now we know that y times root 2 is rational. Okay? But then root 2, since y is not 0, since y is in q and y is not equal to 0, uh, so bear in mind we've just said that this thing is rational. So now we could divide that rational number by y. So we've just, we've just got as far as y root 2 being rational, which of course could happen if y was root 2 or something, but actually y is a non-zero rational number here. So we could divide by it. Uh, root 2 is equal to y root 2 divided by y is in q again by the order of rationals. That's a contradiction. So here's a simple, nice symbol for a contradiction. Since after all root 2 is irrational. So our, there was our dodgy assumption. We see that there was in Q. So that is not in Q. Which is what we wanted. Okay? So that's it. That gives us loads of irrational numbers. So they all use root 2 at the moment. Um, we're going to prove lots of other square roots that are irrational as well in this module. Um, as I said, we won't, we won't be proving that pi is irrational, but it is a, it is a standard true fact from the books. Um, I prefer you to use root 2 than to use pi because um, you're unlikely to see a proof that pi is irrational um, in the near future. Okay, any questions about that result? Yes? Why did you just see two arrows pointing into each other? Is that different between double arrows? Oh, right. So two arrows pointing at each other. This is one of the available notations to mean we have arrived at a contradiction. Okay? Um, there's a, so that's just a, one of the ways of doing it. And everybody has their own. Uh, different lecturers will use different symbols for we have arrived at a contradiction. Um, Okay, so having got all these lots of irrational numbers, we're going to use this to prove something I said before. I haven't done a little bit more work. I said earlier that there are lots of rational numbers and lots of irrational numbers everywhere in the real line. No matter what interval you look in, you will find rational numbers in there and irrational numbers in there. Um, and that's what we're going to work towards now for the end of this lecture. And... Uh, a fine mesh is uh, a Laurel and Hardy reference for anyone who's, who actually remembers Laurel and Hardy. Um, but actually, what we're doing is we're going to be chopping up the real line into small pieces. Now, so let delta be a positive real number, which is likely to be rather small when we use it. Delta is often a very small positive real number, um, like a millionth or 10 to the minus 9 or something like that. Um, but... Uh, I won't do it, so this will be a, I'll now draw you a picture of the real line, and it says here we can chop up the real line into pieces lying between the successive integer multiples of delta. So delta is not, an, normally we talked about multiples of integers, but I'm going to take multiples of a positive real number here, and let me draw the real line for you. And if we start at naught and have delta, 2 delta, 3 delta, and so on, and as minus delta, minus 2 delta, minus 3 delta, and so on, uh, we can see, although delta may, may be rather small, if you keep going, you're going to get as far as you like either way on the real line. You just have to multiply by a really big number to get as far as, to get as, far as you want. Okay? So if you want to get as far as x, you have to make sure you multiply by at least x over delta. Um, that's how, about how far you're going to go. And you can see that we've chopped up the real line here into successive multiples. 
and every real number will be in at least one of these zones, okay? It could be in two if you include the endpoints. So some real numbers, namely the integer multiples of delta, will be in two of these intervals, right? So two delta is at the right-hand end of this interval, and it's at the left-hand end of this interval. So integer multiples of delta are in two of these intervals. Every other real number is in exactly one of these intervals. And if you want to make it be in a unique interval, what you do is you say, you, you sort of express a preference. And here I'm expressing a preference for allowing the left-hand endpoint in the interval and disallowing the right-hand endpoint. So that if you are in two of these intervals, I'm going to say, let's count it as being in the one where it's at the left-hand endpoint and throw out the one at the right. So this thing here, this n delta, n plus 1 delta, that's an interval between successive multiples of delta that's um, on the real line. I'm gonna, oh, maybe I'll have a different colour here. Here is n delta, and here's n plus 1 times delta, which you'll notice is the next one. Um, I'm going to say I don't want to count it if it's at the right-hand endpoint. I'm only going to count it if it's at the left-hand endpoint. If you do that, then you're in exactly one of these. Um, so x is going to be somewhere in here. That's the interval. Remember, the square bracket means that endpoint is included, so that's the n delta included by the solid spot, and the round bracket means that n plus 1 times delta is excluded, so I put the non-solid <coughs> spot. And to say that x is somewhere in here means that it's in this interval, it might be at the left-hand endpoint, but it's not at the right-hand endpoint. And we can clearly do that because if you were an integer multiple of delta, then you are at the left-hand endpoint of one of these intervals. And if you're not an integer multiple of delta, then you're somewhere in the middle of one of the intervals. So you're fine. So that's how to make it unique. Um, if you don't care about uniqueness, then you just say you're, you could allow the closed intervals and say, well, every x is in at least one of them, which would actually be good enough for our purposes. Okay, so that's a, a good start. So now we take a and b to be real numbers with a less than b. And now we take a positive real number delta that's quite small. Delta greater than naught, less than b minus a over 2. b minus a is how far it is to get from a to b. b minus a over 2 is half of that. And delta is less than halfway, half of the distance between a and b. Then I claim that there is some integer m. I don't say whether it's positive or negative or whatever. That there's some integer m. So that a is less than m delta is less than m plus 1 delta is less than b. So let's see what we need to do to do that. So we've got a and we've got b. And the claim is, we haven't succeeded in getting this yet, this is our target, somewhere in here, there's an m delta and an m plus 1 delta. <coughs> Somewhere strictly between a and b. So in fact, I'm not even going to allow the endpoints. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to use this previous fact. We're going to apply this previous fact to a to pick up some n so that x is in one of the, so that a will be in one of these intervals for some n. Okay? Now that n won't be m. So, so the proof is by above, or standard fact, there is an integer n with a is in the half open interval from n delta up to n plus 1 times delta. Then uh, we have 
just what does that mean? That says that Ed delta is less than to A is less than N plus 1 times delta. N plus 1 delta is somewhere to the right of A. Now, could it be that N plus 1 delta has got past B? The answer is no, because delta is too small. Delta is less than B minus A over 2. Um, here, let me note here, i.e., A plus 2 delta is less than B. A plus 2 delta is strictly less than B. That's just rearranging this. So, in fact, as long as you don't go more than 2 delta to the right of A, you can't reach B. Okay, so it turns out what we want is we're going to set n equals n plus 1. Okay, that's definitely an integer. And we do know at least, with n equals n plus 1, we know that we've got the first bit. We do have m delta strictly to the right of a, because that's what we've got here. But we've got a bit more, because n delta is less than to a. Certainly, m delta is greater than A by above. Also, that's supposed to be also, M plus 1 delta, that's N plus 2 delta, um, that's equal to N delta plus 2 delta. And N delta is less than to A. So that's less than to A plus 2 delta, which is less than B. And so we've done it. Um, M delta is bigger than A. M plus 1 delta is less than B. And so we're home. Now, from this, we're supposed to prove that the rationals and the irrationals are dense in R, but we're rather short of time. I'll just give you a sketch. You've got real numbers with A less than B. So you choose a very big positive integer. large enough that 1 over n is less than b minus a. Uh, in ACF you'll get uh, details of why you're definitely going to be able to do that, but basically b minus a is a positive real number, so if you divide by a large enough integer you'll get less than it. You now apply the lemma with delta equals 1 over n, and you get there is an M in Z such that A is smaller than M over N, uh, M, M delta smaller than m plus 1 delta is smaller than b but delta is 1 over n 
A is smaller than M over N, is smaller than M plus 1 over N, is smaller than B. That actually gives you two different rational numbers between A and B. So certainly that gives us at least one rational number. It actually gives you two so far. And of course there's actually infinitely many others. And finally, strictly between those, we can find an irrational number m over n plus half root 2 times 1 over n. That's a half root 2 there. A half root 2 times 1 over n, that's strictly between these two, m over n and m plus 1 over n, because a half root 2 is less than 1. So uh, that's going to be between m over n and m plus 1 over n, so that's also between a and b. And that's irrational by what we proved earlier. And that's in the same interval. Because actually between those two rational numbers I mentioned above. Okay, so that's a, a bit of a fast sketch, uh, but you can fill in the details of that, but we'd better stop there to let the next lot in.